Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me here on Wealth Protector TV. Really excited to have Tom Frazina on with me today, who is an executive coach and board member with a very distinguished career and doing some fantastic work right now with owners and executives across the country. Tom, can you hear me okay? I can. Fantastic. Well, I want to jump right into this, Tom. You and I have talked offline. You've done some amazing things in your career. I, I want to you to give us a bit of a background on your career. And then we're gonna talk about what you're doing now and get into what I'm really excited about to hear more of is the five horizons. So a little bit about your background. Okay, uh, and hello everybody. I've uh, been around longer than most. I started <laughs> working after I got out of the Navy. I am a vet uh, in 1970. And I've started multiple companies uh, in that ensuing 30 or 40 or 50 years. Plus, I had a major role as kind of a co-founder, along with many others, in the video game industry, of which I'm still not only acquainted, but, but attached. And so my specialization initially was sales and marketing. And I grew over time in the various roles until I became the CEO of uh, a personal robot company like an R2-D2 personal robot in 1982. That was my first CEO job. So I, I became a leader at that point in my career, and I have, have been a successful leader and motivator uh, of people both working with me, for me, and around me. And then when I left the video game industry about five years ago, I decided to do that full time. And now I am a professional coach to those who desire a greater path to personal and professional success. So what I do is, when I'm around them, Paul, I get them to where they want to go more quickly and with greater impact when they arrive. Yep. No. Fantastic. And didn't along the way you also serve as a, as a professor at, at USC? You spent some time there? Yes. Uh, when I was in the video game industry, I was uh, the professor at USC for about eight years, uh, teaching a business and marketing class on interactive digital media, which is a fancy way of saying the video game business. Right. So that, that was a very fun job for me to have. I'm still in touch with many of my students who have grown up in the industry, and I've helped many of them get to where they are right now. They're all contributing, now to students, but as deliverers of value, which, which pleases me very greatly. Tom, you'll probably get a kick out of this, but whenever video games are mentioned, I always think back to when I was a kid and going to the local convenience store to play Frogger and Asteroids on the machines. Do you remember those? Uh, easily do I remember those because my, uh, my sons who were all in their 40s kind of grew up with those too when they were three, four, five, and six. So yeah, that's, that's how it started. And then Atari came around in 1976 with Nolan Bushnell as the founder. And that kind of made everything a little more official moving forward. Yeah, interesting. I always hear an interesting stat about Atari that at one point they were the lar one of the largest makers of you know, computers, I think with Commodore, and then both are, went away after, after a while. That's exactly right, Paul. The IBM PC, the, the Commodore 64, and the Atari 4 and 800, those were the, the preeminent home computers until the Apple II came out in 1981, which kind of eclipsed them a bit going forward. But yes, that's pretty much where the games business started on home personal computers. Interesting. Well, now, Tom, you are doing some really interesting things with owners. Obviously, we have a crisis going on right now. So tell me a little bit about your, your practice now. And then I want to get into the five horizons, or as you say, the five R's, they all start with R, which really deal with how businesses can get through the period we're dealing with right now. So can you, can you jump in a bit to that? Sure. My, my native business as uh, an advisor 
and coach to uh, budding entrepreneurs, CEOs, and other executives that want to go farther faster. Uh, that, that remains intact. So I'm still doing that kind of work. But as a result of what's been going on in our world in the last number of months, I've had to expand my point of view to help people uh, whom I know, or even those that I don't, many of your uh, watchers or listeners don't know me, and I'm going to offer them some rather succinct advice over the next four or five minutes, if they'll listen up, please, in terms of what I think you can do to prepare to back in business and, uh, and have some greater impact once uh, this thing resolves itself. So for your consideration, here's my expression of what a company leader should be doing to protect, invigorate, and motivate their staff and customer base as they prepare for and move forward on kind of a fresh launch when they get back into business. Great. It has to do with the five horizons as I see companies moving forward, and they all happen to start with R quite by coincidence. Number one, resolve. You should address immediately challenge to staff and customers to invigorate their beliefs in supporting your company. Things that have become shaky over the last many weeks that they notice since lockdown need to be gradually addressed, but adroitly addressed, just to convince them that you are going to be okay and worthy of their consideration. Number two is resilience. Focus on near-term cash flow management, the most critical element, element of businesses going forward right now. And when I say near-term cash flow management, I'm referring to, in your cash flow, paying for and being prepared to support only those things that you must have between now and the end of the year. And that goes for resources, certain staff members, and other things that you are going to call upon to implement this reinvigorated company of yours. Be very careful not to overextend that, and if anything, just be very, very conservative about that cash flow. And Tom, is there, when you say work, work on cash flow, is that the owner of the business getting in there by him or herself and doing that, or is it getting management together with the owner and sort of having a SWAT team look at the cash flow? Okay, so if it's uh, really medium or large size businesses, it's the CEO and the chief financial officer, the CFO. And if there is a, an operating officer, the COO also, they should gather together in the room and, and map out together the general constraints in which they wanna operate going forward. And then once they come to some conclusions, they want to invite certain key members of the staff that they're going to be keeping in to share that with them. That's, that, that's a, a very careful and predictable way of protecting themselves in terms of what's going to happen and what we don't know is going to happen in the next number of weeks and months. Got it. Love it. So, okay. Okay, great. Uh, number three is return getting back to the original scale you were in quickly. So initiate staff protections within the office space, and I'm talking about health protections, but make sure that you also emphasize cover support with enhanced CRM. That's consumer relationship management. Anybody involved with marketing knows that. It's gonna be very, very critical in messaging out to people who have supported you in the past, that you are here and you're going to be providing value to them going forward. When you say initiate staff protections, I'm looking at my notes here uh, uh, within the office space. Do you mean kind of like spacing issues, mask issues? I mean, things related to, to the virus, that sort of? Yes, stuff? it's it's related to that, and it has to be under the discretion of the particular philosophy of the gal or guy that runs the business. Uh, I am uh, not a fearful leader. I like to push people, uh, but I don't want them getting infected. 
So uh, I want my staff in front of me rather than virtual if I can help it for a variety of reasons. Virtual is helpful, as so I'll get to that in a minute. But, but I'd rather have them on, on, on staff where they can see one another. And, and maybe we have fewer people involved right away. And, and we have staff meetings where we're sitting four or five or six feet apart. You know, I, I can deal with that kind of stuff. But it, it has to be respected and, and responded to in terms of the return to getting back to the original scale quickly. That, so that, it, it's related to that. Got Number it. Okay. four is reinvent. I hope it doesn't happen, but you need a robust contingency plan just in case business as usual fails to resonate with people that matter to you in the current climate. So I can't describe for you what that should be, but you will know what it should be, and you may never have to implement it, but it needs to be on your desk and ready to initiate if, in fact, things don't go as planned. When you, is, do you mean with, with clients and prospects that things don't go as planned with them? Yes, I'm talking about strategy and mission. It may need to be tweaked based on the attitudes of people and what's going on with, uh, with politics and government, which I'm going to get to here uh, on, on the next one, number five. So you just have to be prepared that it may not be business as usual, even though you're going to be prepared and there and ready to deliver really good quality stuff, it may not be consumable to the rate that it was before because of circumstances that exist in the market. Okay. Number five, the last R is reform. So the company participation in a new regulatory environment, if it materializes, and it's a strong if, it may not materialize, but you just never know, and it could be central government, or it could be state government and governors, or it could be local government within the counties. You just never know how people are going to react running those parts, and, and, and therefore, you, you have to be prepared if it materializes. And consequent, the consequence of that happening is you've got to create stringent defenses within your competitive sphere to make sure that your company operates in a secure position and for its mission in protecting itself against competitors that are doing the same thing that you and I are doing right now. You don't know that the competitors are going to be behaving the way they did before or even if they're going to be the same based on reinvent and reform numbers four and five. So you just have to be prepared for that in case it should happen. Do all of this with confidence, make it virtual where applicable, but don't substitute virtual when you can have people working in close proximity to one another, relatively close proximity. You can see their faces, their expressions, how they react to stuff. You cannot do that very well virtually. So you're not a big, you're not a big advocate of working virtually. If it can be avoided, I would prefer it not. Because as a leader, when I need to reach out and see somebody's expression, I, I need to see the way that they react to what I'm telling them in person. I need to see they re, the way they react to their, their compatriots within the company. And the general dynamics of running the company, I, I run companies by getting up and walking around. Only about 3% of the CEOs in the world do that. Oh, I'm too busy, or I don't like it, or they don't want to see me that much, which is a bunch of bullshit. Yep. People love to see the leader walking around and taking an interest. If we have time, I can give you one brief example. I don't know if we have time. Of course we do, yes. Okay. Well, if we have time, uh, here's an example. So a CEO who does not behave the way that I just suggested, which is like 95 to 97 percent of them, decides one day because somebody's pushing him to do it, and it could be a her, of course, they get up out of their chair and they walk into a cubicle and they sit down and they know a little bit about the person that's there and they sit back and they cross their legs and say, so 
uh, how's it going? And of course, the person's going to say, oh, things have never been better. We're ahead of schedule. The budgets are, are running over in revenue. Our overhead is less, and we couldn't be happier. And then a smart CEO says, okay, cut the crap and tell me what's really going on. <laughs> well, we've got some obstacles here that I didn't foresee that are happening. And I've got a couple of employees working for me that I'm dissatisfied with their performance. And our revenue is going to be less. So I'm thinking about having to cut back on overhead. You get So if there's anybody here that's running a company, companies need to run, especially today, with the leader walking around and taking an interest and sitting down and engaging in an oddest fashion with the people that reports to him or her. Well, that's, that's great insight. One of the, the issues that I was thinking about as you were talking is, and I've heard this, and I want your input on it, is companies coming out of this crisis are going to be in a different position, many of them, because many will have taken on additional debt and others, you know, through the stimulus program will have, you know, some pretty large, you know, payback loans and interest rates. And so, for instance, if you're selling a business or you're buying a business, there's going to be maybe a different landscape to, to look at for these businesses. And one business may be in a stronger or weaker position than another because they took stimulus money. What, what's your comment on that? It's a, it's a challenging response that I would have without knowing the companies because part of what I do when I go into coaching uh, the leaders is I know everything there is to know about them personally. For the most part, it's usually okay. Yeah. And about the company, before I start to do my work with them, so, so it's really hard for me to tell you a generalization like that. Right. But I can tell you this. Everybody in the world knows that all companies of all sizes, from the very smallest all the way up to the very biggest, are really, really feeling the pressure right now. They're taking on debt, they're losing employees and market share, and everybody's going through it right now. So people on the other end of that, which are banks and debt holders and investors, and there's no surprise to them that these companies are under a lot of duress. The most important thing you wanna convey in these circumstances is you're going to get out of it quickly and you're going to come back in a robust fashion and you're going to make an impact. And for those that want to focus on what's wrong rather than what's right, tell them just wait and see what I and my staff can do in the next three or four months. And then you can make a judgment. But right now I need to get back into business. And, and if my revenue can come back and I'm managing this properly, then all of the so-called debt, some forgiven and some not, is going to be handled in the next number of months or maybe even years. But the first thing I've got to do is get this company running and generating revenue. I love it. And what I've always been impressed with about you, Tom, we've had a few discussions, is that uh, you're not lacking for an intense focus and it seems like when you start working with these companies, you're all in, you're getting in the gutter, you're getting dirty with them, and it's all about execution for you. Is that a fair statement? It is, Paul. I'm their partner. And if they're getting dirty, I need to get dirty too. Because ultimately, when we set a vision, very important word, vision for the company out three or four or five years, I'm there to get them to that vision more quickly and with greater impact when they arrive than they would be able to do without me. So whatever it takes, I need to get dirty and find out what it's gonna to take to perform. Great, Tom, uh, really enjoyed the discussion. I know we'll be chatting again, a lot to learn from you. So thank you for, for being on the show and thank you everybody listening for uh, staying on with us. And we got through the, the tech, technology here, Zoom's just, overloaded. So I, I think we made it out. Okay. Thanks, yeah, Tom. Looks like it. You bet. Bye, everybody.